Picture this. It's June 1966, and three American-built race cars are crossing the finish line at Le Mans in perfect formation. Four GT40s powered by 427 cubic inch V8s, occupying first, second, and third place. In the pits, Enzo Ferrari watches his empire crumble. The prancing horse had won Le Mans six years straight. They'd never win it again for the rest of the decade. This is the story of how a big block V8, originally designed for NASCAR, brought Europe's most prestigious racing dynasty to its knees. The Ford GT40's victory at Le Mans wasn't just a win, it was automotive revenge served at 200 miles per hour. But to understand how sweet that revenge tasted, we need to go back to 1963. Henry Ford II, grandson of the company founder, wanted Ford to shed its image as a maker of sensible family sedans. He wanted to buy a Ferrari. The negotiations had progressed for months. Ford executives flew to Italy. Lawyers drafted contracts. The deal was reportedly worth $18 million, about $170 million in today's money. Ford would get Ferrari's racing division, their Formula One team, and most importantly, their technological prestige. Then at the 11th hour, Enzo Ferrari walked away. Not just walked, he insulted Ford in the process, calling them unsophisticated Americans who knew nothing about racing. Henry Ford II took it personally. His response was simple and expensive. If he couldn't buy a Ferrari, he'd beat them. Not just beat them, humiliate them on their home turf. At the race Ferrari valued most. The 24 Hours of Le Mans. Ford had deep pockets, but they had a problem. They knew how to build engines that could survive a quarter million miles in suburban station wagons. They didn't know how to build engines that could survive 24 hours at maximum output. Their first attempts in 1964 were disasters. Not one Ford finished the race. In 1965, they managed sixth place while Ferrari took another victory. The European press mocked the American effort. Ford was burning through millions with nothing to show for it. Enter the 427 side oiler. This wasn't some exotic, high-strung European design. It was pure American iron, a big block V8 that traced its lineage back to NASCAR super speedways. But what Ford's engineers did with it would revolutionize endurance racing. The engine started life as the 427 FE Ford Edsel series big block. In street trim, it powered galaxies and fair lanes, but the racing version designated the 427 SOHC was a different animal entirely. Ford's engineers took the basic architecture and completely reimagined the lubrication system. Hence the nickname Side Oiler. Here's what made it special. <laughs> in conventional engines of the era, oil traveled up through the center of the block to reach the main bearings, then out to the rod bearings. Under extreme cornering forces at Le Mans, oil could slosh away from critical components. Engines would starve for lubrication and destroy themselves. The Side Oiler ran a priority main oil. Gallery along the side of the block. Oil went directly to the main bearings first at full pressure before feeding anything else. The crankshaft got oil before the valve train. The bottom end got priority over the top end. It was brilliant in its simplicity. The mains would get oil, even if everything else was starving. Let me put the specs in perspective. The race-tuned 427 displaced 7 liters, 427 cubic inches. Bore was 4.23 inches. Stroke was 3.8 inches. Compression ratio ranged from 10.5.1 to 12.5.1, depending on fuel requirements. With four Weber 48 IDA carburetors, it produced 485 horsepower at $6,200 RPM and 475 pound-feet of torque at 4,200 RPM. Those numbers might not sound extraordinary today. <laughs> but here's the kicker. This engine could maintain that output for 24 straight hours. The Ferrari 330 P3 it was racing against used a 4-liter V12, making 420 horsepower. Beautiful, sophisticated, complex. The Ford made 65 more horsepower with almost twice the displacement and half the cylinders. It was a sledgehammer fighting a rapier. But raw power wasn't enough. Le Mans included the Mulsan Strait, a 3.7-mile section where cars would hit their maximum velocity. In 1966, the GT40 Mark IIs were clocked at 205 miles per hour. 
For comparison, Ferrari's fastest trap speed was 195. Those extra 10 miles per hour meant the Fords were pulling away from the Ferraris every single lap on the longest straight. Over 24 hours, that advantage was crushing. The 427's durability came from over-engineering. The block was cast iron, not aluminum like Ferrari's. It weighed more but could handle higher cylinder pressures without distortion. The Ford steel crankshaft was cross-drilled for oiling and balance to perfection. Connecting rods were forged steel with floating wrist pins. The valve train used solid lifters that could handle sustained high RPM without pump-up issues that hydraulic lifters faced. Ford tested these engines mercilessly. They'd run them at maximum power for 48 straight hours on dynos. They'd simulate Le Mans conditions. Full throttle, brake, turn, repeat. For twice the race distance, any component that failed got redesigned and retested. By 1966, they'd spent an estimated $25 million on the GT40 program. That's about $240 million today. The chassis wrapped around this engine was equally purposeful. The GT40 marked this time. Designed for 1966 was a collaboration between Ford, Carroll Shelby, and Holman and Moody. It stood just 40 inches tall, hence the GT40 name. The aerodynamics were refined in wind tunnels, something Ferrari wasn't doing extensively yet. The body produced actual downforce at speed, not just low drag. The transmission was a departure from European practice, too. Instead of a delicate five- or six-speed gearbox, Ford used a brutal four-speed, basically a strengthened NASCAR box. Fewer gears meant fewer shifts, fewer opportunities for mechanical failure. The wide torque band of the 427 made it work. Where Ferrari screamed through six gears, the Fords thundered through four. Leading up to the 1966 race, Ford ran an unprecedented testing program. They rented Le Mans for private testing sessions. They brought multiple cars and drivers. They practiced driver changes, pit stops, and mechanical repairs. Ken Miles and Lloyd Ruby ran a GT40 for 24 straight hours in testing covering more distance than the race itself. They found problems and fixed them. When race day arrived on June 18, 1966, Ford brought eight cars. Ferrari brought just three. The message was clear. Ford was playing the numbers game, but they were also supremely confident. They'd tested everything that could break and reinforced it. The race itself was a demonstration of American industrial might. The three factory marked the Sainans, Driven by Ken Miles and Denny Hume, Bruce McLaren and Chris Amon, and Dan Gurney and Jerry Grant, dominated from the start. By hour four, they were running first, second, and third. The Ferraris tried to keep pace but couldn't match the relentless speed of the 427s down Mole Sand. Here's where it gets interesting. Ford executives, wanting a publicity photo finish, ordered their three cars to cross the line together. Ken Miles, who was leading, slowed to let Bruce McLaren catch up. They crossed in formation, McLaren Amon first, Miles Hume second, Gurney Grant third. It was the photo Ford wanted, but it cost Miles the victory he'd earned, race and politics at their ugliest. But the statement was made. Ford didn't just beat Ferrari, they crushed them. The fastest Ferrari finished eight, 35 laps behind. It was total domination. The 427 side oiler had done what European racing establishment thought impossible. An American pushrod V8 had conquered the Cathedral of European Motorsport. The technical impact was immediate. Within two years, every major manufacturer was experimenting with big displacement engines for endurance racing. The Porsche 9117 used a 5-liter flat 12. Ferrari developed the 512 series with 5-liter V12s. The era of small, highly strung engines dominating endurance racing was over. Ford had changed the game. The 427 side oilers' influence extended beyond racing. The priority oiling system became standard practice in performance engines. The concept of overbuilding for durability rather than chasing minimum weight influenced a generation of engine designers. NASCAR teams adopted side oiler blocks for their superior bottom end lubrication. Drag racers used them as the foundation for 1,000 horsepower builds. Today, an original 427 side oiler block is worth more than most complete engines. Pristine examples sell for $20,000 to $30,000.
just for the bare block. Complete numbers matching engines can exceed $75,000. They're not just engines anymore. They're artifacts from when America decided to take on the world in one. But here's what really matters about the 427 side oiler and its victory at Le Mans. It represented a fundamental American approach to problem solving. When faced with sophisticated European engineering, Ford didn't try to out-European the Europeans. They didn't build a high-revving, complex V12. They took what they knew, big displacement pushrod V8s, and refined it to perfection. The side oiler was engineered overkill in the best way possible. Every component was stronger than it needed to be. Every system had redundancy. It was the engineering philosophy that put men on the moon three years later. Don't just meet the requirement, exceed it by a factor of two. There's something deeply satisfying about the way Ford won. Ferrari's engines were jewels, beautiful, complex, temperamental. Ford's 427 was a weapon, brutal, simple, unstoppable. It didn't win on elegance. It won on relentless, overwhelming force. It won because Ford spent whatever it took, tested everything that could fail, and showed up with an engine that simply would not break. The 427 side oiler proved that American engineering, when properly funded and focused, could compete with anyone in the world. It took a motor designed for oval track NASCAR racing and used it to humble Italy's finest on a French road course. That takes more than money. It takes engineering courage. In the end, the GT4's victory at Le Mans in 1966 wasn't just about Henry Ford II getting his revenge on Enzo Ferrari. It was about proving that American engineering had come of age. The 427 side oiler was the exclamation point on that statement, 427 cubic inches of it. Today, when you see a GT40 replica at a car show, and most of them are replicas because originals are worth millions, listen to that engine. If it's running a proper 427 side oiler, you'll hear it in the mechanical thunder, the perfect idle that sounds like controlled explosions, the way it builds power like an avalanche. That's the sound that ended Ferrari's dynasty. That's the sound of American engineering pride cast in iron and fed through four Weber carburetors. The story of the 427 side oiler reminds us that sometimes the best solution isn't the most sophisticated one. Sometimes it's the one that simply refuses to fail. Ford built an engine that could take everything Le Mans could throw at it and keep pulling to 205 miles per hour, lap after lap, hour after hour. They won through superior preparation, unlimited resources, and an engine architecture that prioritized survival over everything else. That's the legacy of the 427 side oiler. It wasn't just an engine. It was a statement of intent, cast in iron, and proven in the crucible of the world's toughest race. It showed that American V8s weren't just for straight-line speed on drag strips. They could conquer the twisting circuits of Europe, too. All it took was the right engineering, the right preparation, and the will to spend whatever it took to win. What's your favorite underdog racing story? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more tales of engineering triumph and uh, automotive revenge.